Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to those attending and also to our viewers watching live on the Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon London. This is a meeting of the Environment, Housing and Regeneration Select Committee, and my name is Councillor Wayne Bridges, and I'm Chairman of this meeting. The key role of this committee is to monitor the performance of local public services within its remit and to hold in-depth reviews on topics of resident interest. We engage with a range of external witnesses in our activity, which can include community groups, residents and subject matter experts. Where we identify areas for change or improvement, we make recommendations to the decision-making cabinet. Details of the business to be considered today is shown on the agenda, copies of which are available in the room and also accessible on YouTube underneath the broadcast. For those present in the room and intending to speak, please note that you'll be filmed and any statements you make will be recorded and made public. For those in the public gallery, you will not be on camera. A reminder to councillors, officers and those speaking today that you should turn your microphone button on when speaking. This will ensure you can be heard in the room and by those watching online. Before we get started, uh, just some quick housekeeping, please. We're not expecting a fire alarm this evening. If the fire alarm does go off, please follow the officers to the fire exits and out of the building to designated meeting point, which is the Civic Centre Forecourt. Mobile devices, please, to be switched off or placed on silent. And if we do have residents in the public uh, this evening, there are residents' feedback forms available at the back of the room. With that said, we start with apologies for absence, please. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, apologies have been received from Councillors Brightman and Deville, with Councillor Tubidar present as Councillor Brightman's substitute. Thank you very much, and a warm welcome to Councillor Tubidar, uh, substitute. Any declaration of interest in matters coming before this meeting? I can see none. Thank you. I can confirm that all business, uh, business this evening will be discussed in Part 1, which brings us on to Item 4 to agree the minutes of the previous meeting, pages 1 to 6. Councillor Farley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, page 4, just for the record, I guess, is that we did, did get the uh, documentation on the Ombudsman, ombudsman's uh, so the samples. Um, and also, unless I've, I've missed it, on, within the uh, agenda item five, we did ask about the um, uh, sort of definition of what was, what was deemed to be affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, unless I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken, I'm, I'm not seeing that in there because I think they refer to it as being a mix of. Well, they couldn't define it particularly. It was a, it was, it was a mix of things. Uh, I just wanted to sort of get that in there to, on, on the record, if that's possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Farley. Happy to note that, Neil. Yep. Is that agreed? Thank you very much. Uh, which brings us nicely on to item five, our witness session engagement with tenants and leaseholders. A very warm welcome to our witnesses this evening, Alan and uh, Rose, and also Rod Smith, the officer, who will be introducing the presentation this evening. So whenever you're ready, Rod. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I may, um, Marin's just popped down to pick up our third uh, witness for this evening. Um, if it's okay with the chair, we, we did make a commitment at the last meeting to undertake um, a very short sample survey with tenants and leaseholders and then provide an update um, to the next meeting in connection with uh, engagement. Um, so I thought while we're waiting for our third witness, if perhaps I could just deliver that outcome from that, that survey, just to help. Yes, of course. Yep. Thank you. Um, so the, the commitment was to do a quick sort of litmus test of 100 residents, um, a mixture of tenants and leaseholders. Uh, we completed that exercise. 77% um, were tenants, 23% uh, were leaseholders. Uh, in terms of, of the mix, uh, about two-thirds have been tenants for over 10 years, so they will um, hopefully be able to reflect upon sort of direction of travel in terms of what's happened during their period of tenure with the council, and then smaller number, 14%, 5 to 10 years, and 19% uh, were newer tenants, 1 to 5 years. It's also a good mix across the borough in terms of geographic location um, and in terms of age group. 21% uh, under 45 and 49% in the 46 to 64 age group and 30 over the age of 65. Going into the um, 
detail, the, the questions that we ask also reflect the exact same questions that we ask in our STAR survey, our survey of tenants and residents. Uh, we've kicked off this year's STAR survey, that's underway as we, as we speak, and that includes a 10% sample of our whole customer base, so that's all 13,000 um, tenants and leaseholders. So this is really just a quick, quick litmus test. Um, and in terms of the, the the highlights, really, one of the questions was around how good or or poor um, do residents feel that the council um, is keeping them informed about services and decisions. And in terms of very good, fairly good, uh, we got to 54% there. So just over half. Um, think that we do keep um, our tenants and leaseholders informed about services and decisions. So certainly um, room for improvement there. And interestingly, that's about informed. And if you remember, going back to the, the triangle, um, one would expect those sorts of numbers because we are actively informing, um, but not perhaps going up that, that triangle of involvement. In terms of satisfaction, dissatisfaction, um, with having your say in actually how services are managed, down to 43% there in terms of satisfied or, or very satisfied. And how good or otherwise do you think the council is at keeping you informed about things that might affect you as a resident? Um, again, 47% there, fairly good or very good, and that probably again reflects the fact that we are informing but not perhaps um, engaging or consulting. Moving along there to um, a question around opportunities given to residents to participate in the decision making process, there we start to go down um, to 39% about being satisfied that um, we are involving people in that participation decision making process. So again, that reflects the fact that we're, we, we're, we're not doing as much as we could do in terms of that, that triangle of involvement. Um, we also asked a question around building safety um, and understanding and information that's being shared, um, a, a topical area in terms of safety, fire safety and the like. And again, they're 44%, so certainly under half, um, feel that they're getting enough information on building safety and responsibilities, um, which is of particular interest to us at the moment. Um, a question which uh, could give us some insight into barriers to involvement was around anything which stops um, our residents from being involved in housing and other community type activities. So these, these aren't percentages, but just numbers, because um, some individuals have gone for two areas. But one of the biggest categories there, time commitment. So 34 out of 100 around time commitment. Um, those that perhaps can't really find something they're particularly interested in, just six. Um, those wanting to know more about how they could be involved. So there's a, um, there's a cue for us there, 15. Uh, eight had caring responsibilities, a couple with language barriers, 19, fairly high number there, linked to disability or health, um, which we'd certainly want to drill down a little bit more, um, 10, saying they're already involved to some degree, and a sort of don't know category was, was 22. So a few insights there into the potential barriers that we can take on board. But again, with the bigger sample survey being undertaken this year, it would be interesting to see how those, those numbers pan out. And then we asked a direct question around um, being interested in particular areas. Um, does that fire anybody up? 28, um, particularly interested in community activities, 26 in resident groups, um, focus groups and consultation around particular issues, 28, fairly high number, special interest groups, perhaps around disability, um, again 28. Repair service came out um, high at 36 there, and that could be around um, levels of dissatisfaction with the service. So in a way, that is a positive, people wanting to become involved and perhaps shape and influence some of the services we provide. Uh, estate services, so that would include things like um, caretaking um, and our grounds maintenance service, 23, so again, fairly high. 
um, individuals wanting to be involved in perhaps production of information such as their annual report or quarterly newsletters, uh, 15 residents there, and nine interested in helping us with developing online um, uh, information or, or services. And then a, a catch-all sort of other category was, was 24. So fairly short but fairly punchy. Um, some interesting numbers there, some interesting perhaps um, can open us more than anything else but once we get involved in the, the star survey much bigger numbers it'll be interesting to see how that pans out and certainly that will help um, or be another strand to um, support development of the engagement pardon me the engagement strategy itself thank you very much um, are there any questions at this point by members councillor Gardner um, when you do the bigger survey, how are you going to cope with the problems, language problems? Because a lot of the tenants have got, um, well, they don't speak English, it's not their first, first language. I just wonder how, how you can get around that, because also you've got to bear in mind that um, residents that some of us deal with, they, they also, they might live in council properties, but they also regard, if people come and ask them questions, they're not quite sure why they're asking the questions, so you've got to make them feel at ease. I just wonder how you could, you're going to be able to do that? So with every uh, consultation or engagement activity, uh, there's always that line to say, if you need help, please contact us. And that's even with just filling out the survey, even for people that do, um, that do not have a language uh, barrier. So there's always that opening there for them to come back to us, and then we'll walk, the, we'll walk them through the process. We have access to DA languages if, there's, if we need interpretation um, of any <coughs> sort, uh, where we don't have um, a staff <coughs> member covering that language within the CVIC. Thank you, Councillor Kaufman. Thank you, Chairman, um, and thanks, Rob, for your comments on this. Um, <coughs> in particular, com comment on the repair service which came out extremely high. Um, I recently had a, a, a situation where um, a resident got in touch with me concerning a lift for a disabled <coughs> person, the, his son, extremely disabled, 18 year old, and it took 14 weeks. The guy had to haul his kid up the stairs to go to the loo, etc., etc. Uh, as soon as I raised it with, uh, at a higher level, it was done within the hour. So these sort of things, you know, we must get ahead of these repair service issues. Um, and I think once we do, that number will drop. Thank you. I think just, just to pick up on that, thank you for those, um, those comments. I haven't got anybody here from the repair service, but what we've, we've tried to do um, is pick up on those areas of interest. And I think what, what I've tried to reflect is um, we are aware that we've had some expressions of dissatisfaction with the repair service and to have you know, that number of people come forward in a relatively small um, sample survey to say they would be interested in working with us, I think it can only be for the benefit really to get that real you know, yeah. customer perspective on, on what we're doing. What was the percentage, Rod? Uh, where are we? Repair? Yeah, 36. 36. So quite high. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Thanks. Councillor Chapman? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thanks for the report. Uh, in terms of item nine, how interested are you in being involved in the following areas? Uh, you've got the general box at the bottom, sort of over, and you said there was 24. I just wondered whether you could indicate, I'm, I'm assuming it's more than just one item with 24 people, but what, what, what ed others people had in mind exactly? The other thing I was just going to ask is, I understand you're going to be doing a much more wider survey. Um, if you take, for example, um, how good or poor do you think? Obviously, it's 54% are very good or fairly good. Will you be putting in a sort of comment section so that people who are dissatisfied can elaborate, so to speak, and explain why? Thank you, yeah. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, just on that, that last point, perhaps while Marion's seeing if we've got that, that further detail for you. Yeah, there, there certainly are free text comments. Yeah. Um, and um, although... Uh, they can be very, very varied and very tailored to individual circumstances, such as the um, case councillor Corfman mentioned. They do add a certain richness to the to the feedback, and it's often those those individual comments that you can um, 
you can learn a lot from. Marion is. Just drilling down into the other that you mentioned. Okay. Some of some of the other is basically where people have expressed their own uh, personal issues, <laughs> where it's not on the on the list, but they need to get it off their chest. Um, so it's it's mainly around the encounter. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. That's fine. Thank you. Councillor Farley. Thank you, Chair. Oh, that's Marion. That was actually something I was. <laughs> we, we, we thought there was actually anything was more sort of qualitative um, in, in terms of that, and what they were, they were yeah. raising issues. Um, just going back to the, the, uh, the first part in terms of the split, um, I was wondering whether there's any distinction in terms of the responses between tenants and leaseholders. Could you use your microphone, please? Thank you. <laughs> 77% of the respondents are tenants and 33% are leaseholders. And uh, within that, 67% um, of them have been with the council for over 10 years. So they've walked through like um, various, they've seen us through various phases. And 19% uh, have been with us um, between one and five years and 14% between five and 10 years. If I, I think if I understand your question correctly, I think it was more about you know we're getting different feedback from from different different tenures. Oh, okay. um, this is a fairly light touch, mm -hmm. and the reality is we, you know we haven't got all of that detail. When we go out to our, our wider customer base, um, you know we're expecting um, sort of a minimum of 1,300 responses, and we will certainly be drilling down there um, f for more detail. You know, a good example would be something like um, value for money on services, where we often get far more feedback from leaseholders in terms of the service charges they're paying compared sometimes with our, with our tenant population. So that's why it's important to get that, that skew right between um, tenants and leaseholders, but also understand who's responding to those, those questions. So we tend to put um, a lot more um, should we say analytical um, investigation into those, you know, that, that bigger bit of work rather than this, this, this quick test which we wanted to get under our belt and share something with you tonight in the time we had available. So sorry we haven't got that detail for you. Thank you very much. I cannot see any other members indicating, so Rod, perhaps you would uh, like to just comment forever and introduce our witnesses for this evening. Microphone, thank you. <laughs> I'll get there by the next session. Um, it's replaced the uh, Zoom mute. Yeah. Um, so, uh, first up, we've got Rose uh, Ross from, um, she's one of our long standing tenants. I don't know if you'd like to introduce yourself, Ros. Hi, um, I'm Ros George. Um, do you want me to start by saying what I did? Uh, well, you, you could just say how long you've been with us for, and, and you know. Right. And um, I've been doing what I used to do for about 17 years. Um, I live in Sutcliffe House, a, a block of flats down the Uxbridge Road. Um, generally, when you shut your front door, it's lovely. Not so good. Um, outside um, but um, it's it's busier than it used to be um, dirtier than it used to be um, not as well kept as it used to be so it's quite sad really um, okay. Okay, okay. Then, yeah, then so in look. the 17 <laughs> years <coughs> is that alright? Yeah, yeah, sure. In the 17 years, I was the street champion and the state champion, which meant that I used to do a state walkabout. Um, I was an, a state inspector, which meant that every two weeks I wrote a report on the state of the how the blocks were, the high rise and the low rise. I had to fill in forms and um, put remarks on the back of the form and then send it, send it in. Um, 
which could be anything. It could be tenants' complaints. It could be things that were going wrong with the building. It could be the lifts out of order. It could be um, fly tipping. It could be uh, rubbish collection. It could be anything that was occurring on the estate I could report on and feedback. I attended the Senate meetings. I was a better neighbourhood member, which meant that you sat on a board of selected people from different estates and um, you could ask for money um, to improve your estate. And the people around who were on that committee could vote um, if it was a worthwhile cause or not. And if it was voted, yes, you needed it, then you, you would get the money and the work would be carried out. When, when I was on um, this Better Neighbourhood um, Board, I, <coughs> we had um, gravel round our building and the drug dealers used to come and leave the drugs buried in the gravel. People used to leave money in the gravel and then the drug dealer would come along, take the money and bury the drugs there. I got that removed and we had flagstones then, heavy flagstones put round the building and then it stopped. So that was a wonderful um, achievement. Um, I, I was on the town field community committee um, which meant that we did also did walkabouts, but that was the whole estate. We did the whole of um, Townfield, um, and that was reporting on things that were not good. I attended all the meetings. I had all contacts with all the departments. I could ring up anybody in any department and I would get through to that person and I would be able to speak to them, tell them what the problem was and I would get feedback straight away. And I felt that was giving me and my estate a real um, thought that you're being listened to that it was, it was being taken in and being listened to and something was going to be done or would be done about it. Um, and then I would, be, I would have phone calls to say, yes, Ros, you know, this is going to happen or, or, and, or they would come down and meet me. Um, I did training for... Um, how to run a meeting, how to be a chairperson. There were lots of meetings, um, a long training uh, to sit on committees, um, how to speak at committees, um, how to conduct yourself, um, how to chair a meeting, um, language that was acceptable and not acceptable. Um, I was a secret shopper. Gosh. <laughs> Um, I was. I felt that I was being listened to all the time. Nobody ever put me down. Nobody ever told me I was talking hogwash. Everybody was pleasant, never rude. Never, ever did I come across anybody that was ever rude. It was lovely to work for the way it used to be. I wish with all my heart that it could go back to those days because they were good days. You were listened to. You were taken notice of. And you felt like you were doing something both for your community, the place where you lived, and for yourself. 
I still get, although I was told when the change came, I was told that my services were no longer required. My people in my block still come to me. They still knock on my door and say, Ros, this is happening with the caretaker. The lifts haven't been cleaned. What are you going to do about it? And I say, okay. So I do my best to get in touch with somebody. I don't always manage it because you've spent ages on the phone um, and it's difficult to reach people these days. Sometimes I do, I manage it and I don't always get the right response and not always things are done now. I have got a new caretaker because our estate got into a really bad state, terrible. We have a new caretaker, but it's a bigger state and it hasn't been properly cleaned for the last four or five years. So it, it's in a bit of a pickle, to be honest, and he's got a really hard job on his hands. I'm doing my best um, to smooth the, the, the waters between the tenants and the new caretaker, um, but it's difficult, it's very hard. He's got a very, very hard job on his hands. Um, I've done consultations on front doors, um, on lids, um, on windows, on, on all manner of things that were happening to the building, to the block, to the estate. I, I sat on all the consultations and, yeah, and that... That's me. Thank you very much. Uh, Alan, would you like to go next? Good evening to everybody and to anybody that's watching this via the internet or wherever. Um, my name is Alan Clark. I'm the secretary. It's got me down as chairman, but I'm the secretary of the Hillings and Lee Soldiers Association. Um, we've been in existence now for about 30 years. Uh, we represent 3,000 plus lease holders in the borough and we have an active membership of about 200 people. <clears throat> Throughout the 30 years, I've, I've been actually been on the committee for about 22 of those years, but throughout those 22 years there's been lots of changes in the council. Some good, some unfortunately bad. Uh, good ones, obviously streamlining the services uh, at that time to try and make it easier to get hold of people rather than be pushed around from pillar to post. Um, bad was when they did, a, did away with the uh, leasehold uh, department and farmed it out to other departments. We had our own separate leaseholders department uh, within the council, which was actually funded by leaseholders. All the staff wages and all the pension, etc., and all the costs, lighting, building, was actually uh, put against leaseholders' charges, but for some reason they decided to do away with that. And a number of the staff obviously have gone. Um, but over the years, seen lots and lots of changes um, within the council where, as I say, due to cutbacks or due to staff leaving and their posts being amalgamated into other things, it's, it's awkward, as Ross said, to actually try to get hold of people uh, on a daily basis. So I'm in a, in a way, I'm fortunate because the secretary, I do have some contact email addresses and some phone numbers that I can ring people, but uh, I always get complaints from other leaseholders saying that they've tried to get hold of grounds maintenance, tried to get hold of caretaking, tried to get hold of repairs, and they're being, they feel they're being pushed from pillar to post. Yeah. But having said that, you know, some of the services, I mean, I live on a small estate of 12 properties, I can't complain about the caretaking. It's cut, grass is cut twice a year, sorry, twice a month uh, during the growing season and probably once a month during the summer seasons. Uh, caretaking, about 75% I would give it. There are good weeks and bad weeks, um, but as I say, we're glad to have a caretaker. As far as the majority of services go, I mean, we've heard tonight 
Uh, there's no way that a lift should be out of service for eight to ten weeks or longer or when a councillor can just make a phone call and it's repaired within an hour. I mean, the fact of the matter is that a lot of the lifts were supposed to be on contract and the contractors should have designated response times to look at those lifts. Now, obviously, if it's a case of a part needs to be ordered, then fair enough, that may take a few weeks. But certainly, you shouldn't have lifts out of all order, especially when you've got disabled people that need the lifts. And, you know, you can talk about Fairley House and the Goldings in Uxbridge. Um, I think one set of the lifts only goes, one of the lifts only goes to odd or e even floors, so it doesn't stop at all floors. So if the other lift goes out of, and goes out of order, um, it means disabled people are stuck between, between floors where they can't get down to get the lift, etc. So yeah, I think uh, a better response on the list, you know, where especially where you've got um, uh, disabled people, needs to be taken into account, and a response time needs to be sorted out, you know, within a, within hours, really. I would have thought. <coughs> As I say, with um, with the leaseholders association, it's it's an ongoing thing trying to attract new members because when we first started um, all those years back we had 500 properties on our books and we used to have six monthly meetings and AGMs and they were always well attended probably because of the free food etc but they were always well attended now we have about 200 it's, it's roughly kept like that for the last seven or eight years and the actual age groups of leaseholders, I think it's really the majority of leaseholders that are our members are now elderly people. You know, they're 60 plus. There are some younger ones, but mainly 60 plus. So trying to engage with younger leaseholders to try and get them to come forward, to become members, etc. It's a little bit difficult. That's, I'll leave that like that, shall I? Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Uh, and we will finally go to Natalie. Good evening, Natalie. Uh, if you want to give some comments to the committee, and then we'll put out questions. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Natalie Lindsay. I'm living on the Avondale Drive estate, and I've been there for approximately 10 years. Um, I was one of the fortunate ones. Like 10 years ago, there was a training uh, initiative, and I was one of the people who was on that training initiative. Um, that training initiative was really for um, people who were out of work for an extended period of time. Um, and there was about 10 or 12 of us on it. And um, from that training session, we got, well, most of us had um, work placements, which were not paid, but for people who were out of work for a period of time, that would have been really good on our CV. And, um, probably could say I was one of the lucky ones who secured my placement as a permanent role. So that, that's probably one of the biggest highlights for me since living um, on Avondale Drive. Um, as you have said, it's, those days back it was, I wouldn't say it was great, but it was a lot better. I think we have suffered a lot from um, antisocial behavior, um, especially in the, stair, in the stairways. Um, the doors have been fixed quite regularly and broken just as regularly. So there's always um, mess in the, um, the stairways. Um, we have also had a new um, caretaker, He's a very young man, and I would say he has a really big job on his hands, so like trying to keep up with three buildings where the doors are broken and there's just so many people, young people, on the estate that are not doing anything. And I think that's really the biggest problem that we're having on Everton Drive at the moment. There's a big group of young people, and young people I'm saying between the age of 14 and 25, <coughs> and they're just loitering. They, they don't go to school, or they don't seem to go to school, and they're just <coughs> in the buildings. The thing is, there's times when there's people sleeping rough in the building, and I wouldn't advise anyone to speak to them, I surely wouldn't, but the fact that they have that access, I think, is a massive problem. Um, with our lifts, um, I haven't had any problems so much per se, but I do have um, issues with, you know, health issues, so for me, 
the lift being working is a is a big plus for us. Um, they don't usually go that long. Um, there's usually at least one working, and they do go to all the floors. I think maybe just the 12th floor, the last one, I think that's probably all the floor that the lifts don't go to. But um, I haven't um, heard anyone complaining too much because there's always one working. But I think with 12 floors, it's best to have both lifts working at the same time. Um, I served on the committee, the Avondale Drive what's it called, um, Association as a secretary for a year, but because of prior commitments, schooling and stuff, I wasn't able to, you know, stick with that, but, you know, I did stint with that at one point. Um, I think um, the thing that I would love to see most with the regeneration coming through is a space for people to meet. At the moment, there's nothing there. I think we usually have our meeting at um, the Minute School. Um, I remember trying to get their netball courts one summer, and that didn't prove, that didn't work out. But there were so many young girls, um, 11, 12, that age group, just hanging around with the boys. And I thought if we were able to have some, you know, netball session, there's something to bring them together, something for them to do. But um, so I would really love to see something like that being incorporated in what's happening now. Um, there's so many women on the estate that their day is taking the kids to school and picking them up back in, in the afternoon. There's nothing for them to do. There's people who go out to work who, you know, their day is a bit more full. But for those people who are just home, you know, we have an estate, we do have the space where, even if it's a trail, uh, what do you call it, a container, something where if it's maybe every six months, you know, a coffee morning. I mean, I may not necessarily be there, but I'm just saying that something needs to be, you know, put in place. Even the training that I did <coughs> 10 years ago, it's needed again because there's so many people since, especially since COVID, people have lost their jobs. And with that come low confidence. And you have so many women who are single, single, single house, single parent household, you know, need that, need that push, I think, to, you know, get back on their feet. So I think if something could be done in that regard, getting them people more involved. I can't say much about the men because I really don't see the men like hanging around or sitting around. So as a single parent, I'm appealing for the single women um, <laughs> um, to, you know, let's empower our women. I think, I think the space is there for it. The time is there for it. Um, we may not get a, a lot of response, but the fact that if it's put out there, because in the estate of three, three tower blocks, there was only 10 of us. But that's 10 people given the opportunity to, you know, make something of themselves. And I've taken my opportunity and run with it. And I'm sure if it's put back out there, another maybe one or two, maybe three, will take that opportunity. So hopefully that could be considered. And sorry, I'm going on and on, but just one more thing. Activities, sporting activities. Um, not sport, right? For me, netball is my thing. Don't know who else would want to do it, but we haven't given them the choice or the opportunity to see if it's something that they would try. You know, women are generally not sporty, <laughs> if that's if that's the word. But I think if the opportunity is there, there's a basketball court, which I use it. But because there's always young men there, most women won't use it. But we do have the space where we could put a netball court, even a half court. Or maybe if it's not netball, but we do need to start engaging with the community a bit more. Because apart from when it's general meeting or association meeting, there's nothing. That's my two cents. Thank you very much. It's been very useful. Um, I will put out the questions. Is there any comments the officers wish to make before I invite the members to ask questions? Okay. We'll start with Councillor Gardner, please. Thank you to all three of you. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, I've been around on the council for coming up for 28 years, so I know what you mean about the changes. Um, <coughs> I remember when there were estate managers, 
uh, that new uh, residents went around. I'm sure you remember them as well, Ron. <laughs> so you could go around and you, you, you'd be able to tell them what was wrong. I, I get the feeling, and to be perfect, I'm with all three of you, that you're slightly undervalued because of the, the, the things that you do and the fact that I, I think it's horrendous that you have people coming to you. If you, if you were originally told that you weren't wanted anymore and yet you've still got people because you're part of the community, so they come to you and they trust you. I mean, there's something, I think there's something quite wrong there. I love the fact that you want to empower people and trust me, I'm well into empowering women and getting stuff. Well, I think we've got massive communities in different estates and they need to be involved in what's, what's going on basically. But do you actually, the, the three of you, individually, do you feel undervalued by the council? Is that here? Shall I answer that? <laughs> well, I, I just feel that over the last, especially over probably the last eight or nine years, where we used to engage quite a lot with the council officers, we used to have regular meetings. In fact, the meetings got too many at one stage and we had to tell the council officers we want to <laughs> cut back but um, probably about 12 14 years ago we used to have local housing forums mm -hmm. where you had committees uh, made up people like Ros etc we'd all meet and we'd all discuss local things mm -hmm. they became better neighborhood team meetings mm -hmm. later on we used to have a housing forum mm -hmm. where every tenant and resident organization used to attend mm -hmm. And then, in its wisdom, the council decided that we would have what was called a Senate, right? And the Senate meetings were meant to take place once a month, which then went to once every couple of months, which wasn't too bad. And then it went to once every, I think it was six months, then once a year, and, uh, and, not, at all. and then not at all, really. <laughs> so I'm not even sure if the Senate still exists. I know that, uh, obviously, with staff shortages and... Uh, you know, it, it's awkward to organise Senate meetings, and especially, uh, and I know that Marion's organised one be, as well, and you also organised them with Lisa Taylor as well, didn't you? Uh, yes. Yeah. The last one we had was... Um, the, the last one we had uh, was in 2019, before COVID. That's right. Uh, one in May and one in, uh, in December. Yeah. So we had, the, we had two in that year, yeah. that time. But yeah, obviously... The only thing about it is, is that I, I do believe that our meetings with council officers um, became, to a certain extent, more what the council wanted to tell us than listening to what we had to say to yeah. them. Yeah. Decisions had already been made on what the agenda was going to yeah. be, etc. And I really think that uh, it should have been a two-way thing. Yeah. I mean. The first thing that we always do at any meeting that we have with the council, the, I think someone, the chair says, can we wait until the end to ask questions? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the time to ask the question is there and then because come the end of the meeting, sure. it's, you've got about five or ten minutes to ask your questions, mm -hmm. you know. And I know that obviously time is short during meetings and it can drag on, you know, and people can talk for ages, probably like me. But, <laughs> the, fact that, but the fact of the matter is, is that you need to engage more, as we know. You know, I, I believe there's government regulations coming out again, which which means that the council must engage more with its tenants and leaseholders, which is fair enough. But the council always used to do that. Ten years ago, twelve years ago, they did that all the time, and there was no. It wasn't following government guidelines. It's because they wanted to engage with us, but something went wrong. And it, the last eighteen months, you can blame it on COVID fine, no problems, but meetings have dropped off way before that anyway. So. Yes, of course, feel free. It was an open question to all of you, so if you wish to comment, then by all means, please do. Um, yeah, regarding what you said, Councillor Gardner, I, do, I, I feel um, undervalued, but um, I can't turn tenants away if they come to me and ask me for help or for my advice, I can't say to them, look, I don't do it anymore, go away, I, I can't help you. That's not, that's not me. And I have 
tried sometimes, several times, to get through to somebody for help for a tenant, and I've been told, well, we can't speak to you because it's not your... And, and that not only hurt, um, made me feel like an, an interfering busybody, um, but it hasn't helped that tenant, and I, and I feel sad about that because that was one of the things that I really... Well, a part of, of what I enjoyed was being able to help people, put them to the right direction, um, help them to get the result that they, they wanted. Thank you. Councillor Gardner, do you wish to comment further? Or no, perhaps no. Natalie, would you like to answer? Can you use your microphone, please? Sorry. Um, don't, I don't have a lot to say on that one because I haven't actually been as active as probably these um, guys. So for me, um, as undervalued, I don't have a lot to say on that um, for myself. Yeah. But I do think there's, um, there's a need for more engagement from the, um, the council with the leaseholders and tenants. That's fine. Thank you very much. Councillor Gardner, do you wish to add anything further? It, it's quite a difficult one for me because I, I'm the chair of a, of a housing co-op and if we've got a problem, we ring the management agent and say, will you do this? Can this get done? We, we, you know, we pay rent, we don't own the properties, but we have somebody, we've got a named person for every single item. If we've got problems with the rent, if people come to me, I ping them over to somebody else the same as repairs. I can't work out why you haven't got a set of numbers that you can ring individuals about specific issues. I see you shaking your head. I'll, I'll leave it like that. I mean, I think all the, all the councillors on here will understand what I'm saying, yeah. that they're, they're things that, that you should have as basically as your right as residents and tenants. And that's my rant. Thank you. Would you like to comment? All I was going to say was that um, we used to have telephone numbers yes. of people <laughs> and names. Um, and obviously email addresses came later on. But the thing about it was, was that uh, in its wisdom, the council didn't want officers uh, being tied up, answering people's phone calls, because some people would ring them three or four times a day sort of thing. So they went to obviously um, intercept the calls with the call centres, and the call centres take the calls, and then they take messages and they send the messages to that person and whether or not you get a response from that person depends on whether or not they've seen their messages and whether or not they come back to you or not. But. Councillor Kaufman. Thank you, Chairman. I think you three are brilliant. I'd love to get stuck in with all the problems that you've got as a ward councillor. And the thing I was going to ask you, uh, do you know your ward councillors? Yes. Oh, right, OK. OK, are they helpful? Sorry? Are they helpful? Judith, uh, Judith Cooper, was very Sorry. Judith Cooper um, when we used to have estate inspections, would always come round and I would always meet her and we would talk. Obviously, council officers would be there as well. Um, but yes, yeah, she was always helpful. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Yes, I've got uh, Lynn Allen and oh. Councillor Peter Curley. <laughs> that's lovely. But, um, uh, <laughs> uh, um, Peter's lovely and he does, um, he's very calm and very nice to speak to and will help. That's good. Councillor Allen's been nice as well. Yeah. And well done to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right. Councillor Farley. Thank you, Chair. And once again, thank you to I'm coming in this evening. It's appreciated. Um, uh, with, I mean, one thing to the officers I'd like to say is, is Obviously, hearing what we've we've heard, I'd like to sort of get some feedback as, as to what what's been sort of given here in, in sort of testimony over you know why some of these these things have, have sort of declined over time. Um, uh, but to, to Alan, I'd also like to ask in terms of the, le the leaseholders. I mean, I, I, I've as I go around, go around my ward in, in Botwell, speaking with lease, leaseholders there, and you've mentioned it yourself. There's a, there's a uh, a feeling that things are done to you rather than sort of collaboration. Um, and particularly with things like when things actually get, get done on, on estates or on, on, on blocks, um, 
it's certainly a feeling that I've been told by by, by leaseholders that, that that is, you know, the that thing is done and it may be like an afterthought to a, to a degree. Uh, I was wondering if you could sort of elaborate more on on the the, the, uh, the feeling from your your, your uh, members in your in your in your uh, group uh, as to how how they interact with the council and how they interact through through you. The first thing that we always say to a member is if you've got an issue with the council, have you taken it as far as you possibly can? Because uh, it's no good then coming to us straight away and saying, oh, please can you just take this complaint up with the council? We need to know who they've spoken to, when they spoke to them, how long they've been waiting for replies, etc., that type of thing. As I said to you, I've been very, very lucky to be able to keep names, phone numbers and emails um, of various people. Rod is very, very good. I must admit, it's not, not, not just saying that because he's here, but he's very good, very helpful. And if he can't deal with it, he'll put me in direction of the people that can. And I normally get a response. From members, it, it varies. One of them being lifts out of order, especially down in Cliftonville in Kent, where we've got um, about uh, 60, 70 properties down there in a tower block. Um, they're always having problems with their lifts, etc. Um, I know that the lifts, obviously in Uxbridge, both in uh, Fairley House and the Goldings, used to go out of uh, operation quite a lot and uh, always used to get rung up by one of the residents who was disabled. Um, members do have difficulties getting hold of council officers. Um, it's just one of those things that, unfortunately, with the call, with the call centre, because they intercept the majority of calls, um, you are waiting um, a long time, possibly days, weeks sometimes, to get the response that you actually need. The call centres themselves, you know, um, we've had a meeting um, at one stage, we had a Senate meeting, and the call centre told us exactly what they do to take all the calls and they were taking on, there was talk that they were going to take on the repairs as well at that stage, so I'm not too sure if they have taken on the repairs or whether or not the repairs still have their own uh, people that answer the calls. But I mean, there's obviously various days of the week, probably Mondays and Fridays, when it's difficult to get hold of anyone on the council because the lines are busy, etc. But as I say, the majority of leaseholders, they just want to have the services that they're paying for. So if they're paying for caretaking, they want to see that their buildings are kept clean. If they're paying for grounds maintenance, they want to see that the grounds are kept in good condition. Um, if they're paying for communal repairs, they need to know where the repairs are being done. I mean, we get an end of year service charge bill and I always query uh, my day-to-day -day repairs bill because sometimes it's low, sometimes it's high. I always get a printout of the repairs that have been done and I challenge some of the repairs and find, you know, that they shouldn't have been on the bill anyway. So, you know, there are these things. But majority of leaseholders just want to live in decent properties at a decent price, you know, obviously, because although they buy them, they've still got service charges to pay. And, you know, I'm not saying that service charges should be kept artificially low. If work needs to be done, then it has to be done. I've had quite a bit of work done on my estate over the last few years, and I've had to pay a considerable amount of money. But at least I can see that the estate is being well cared for. A lot of people um, have been paying money, and their estates haven't been looked after. You know? I mean, it's got so bad that Hayestown Centre is now being knocked down and going to be regenerated with new properties, etc. Um, because no matter how much money it was costing leaseholders and tenants through their rents, etc., nothing really was showing as good value. You know, drug dealing was still rife, you know. Um, there was murder there. I think a couple of years ago there was a murder there. It's... Um, you can't have estates like that, you know, which are just left. People go in and we'll just close them in, you know. I mean, if you look at Hayes Town Centre, and I've got a committee member uh, that lives in Hayes Town Centre, when I take her home, it's like dropping her off at a local prison. It's shuttered up all the way round, you know. It's got 
barbed wire, well, I won't say barbed wire, but it's got high fences, you know, it's got security gates. I mean, it just looks like you're dropping off somebody to a prison. It really is. And, you know, I often wonder whether or not it's to keep people out or to keep them in, you know, mm -hmm. because it does look really, you know, it's atrocious. I'm just, I know that looking from some of the information that I've finally received um, about the new proposed buildings for the Hayes Town Centre, they do look really nice. But, what you have to say is, what will they look like once they're built? What will they look like 20 years after? Will they be well maintained, or will it be the same drug dealers dealing drugs in those in different properties? You know, so I think it's a, it's a question of you can have safer neighbourhood teams uh, patrolling estates. You can have all manner of groups trying to help out, even residents' associations. You know are a good thing because they know the troublemakers on the estates, you know. But as I say, this this information, you know, has to be acted upon. You know, if you want to keep your estates nice, you know, and well run, then you have to be prepared to do something, whether or not that's reporting drug takers or drug sellers or whatever, so be it, you know. Thank you, Councillor Farley. Do you wish to add anything further? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I was just looking, looking to, towards the uh, interaction um, and what what the leaseholders or, how, or I'm going to get the sort of the angle of where uh, the engagement is for uh, for repairs or major things that are being done and then it's, it's shared out. Um, the the uh, sort of the consultation, I guess, is what we're getting at with with leaseholders about how how that works, you know, what sort of time frame you're given to sort of feedback into any any consultation on a repair that's needed for XYZ roofing or guttering or whatever it might be, uh, you know, drains or whatever. Um, it's sort of how that how that, that is working for you for you you and your and your members. The complaint has to obviously be quite bad for them to come to me because a, a lot of leases are quite capable of dealing with their own issues. Some leaseholders won't bother to complain even though it might be a nuisance. But if a leaseholder complains to us, let's take an example, like you said, guttering. If the guttering is leaking or the guttering is falling down, they've been on to the council, um, to the repairs, um, and they've got, these days you have to get an appointment, etc. And it may be that the appointment's been missed, that they haven't come, etc. So they'll come through to us. I will chase it up with the repairs, um, obviously, I will take any information they, that they've got, like job numbers, etc., and I will chase it up with the repairs and see what the situation is. You know, if, if it's um, if it's something that's been missed um, because something else more important came up and they were taken off that job, then fair enough. But if it's a question like they didn't bother to turn up, then obviously I will then, hopefully, uh, with my dealings with the repairs department, expect that fault to be cleared within a week or two, you know. I mean, I can't guarantee that I can do everything for leaseholders that respond to us, to, you know, to ask us to help out, because some of them, some of the things that they talk about are out of our control, and it does need direct interaction with council officers. But I will always try to point them in the right direction, and if I don't know which officer, a quick email to Rod, Rod will normally give me the information to pass back on to them. As far as leaseholder interaction goes, um, we have committee meetings ourselves once a month, once a month, once every five weeks. We also have an AGM, although obviously during COVID, both committee meetings and the AGM had to be cancelled, and our next AGM won't be until 2022. Um, I'm hoping, you know, that all our leasehold members and also leaseholders in the borough haven't had any problems with COVID and that they're still well and healthy. But unfortunately, you know, the, good, the chances are that some, some of our members or some leaseholders in the borough have fallen foul to this deadly disease, you know. So, you know, to those families, I'll just, you know, extend my heartfelt sorrow to them. But... Um, as I say, with leasehold interaction with the association and and with the members, you know, with the committee and the members, um, we invite our leaseholders to attend any committee meetings they want to. 
we've had some success. We've, you know, we're, we're a committee of six, and sometimes we have three or four uh, leaseholders turn up, which out of 3,000 is not a lot, you know. And at the AGM, you know, we might have 50 or 60 members turn up out of 3,000, you know. But we send out the information to all our leaseholders, you know, in the borough. So uh, hopefully, as I say, we might get better responses at a later date, you know. But it's, um, it is awkward, um, as I say, retaining members, getting new members to come along to interact with us. Um, it's awkward to the point that, you know, I, we try to work, you know, we try to think of different ways that we can actually attract new members. I mean, we did at one stage um, have to ask the leaseholders in the borough as to our funding, as to what level of funding that we could have. And as I say, I didn't expect a big response, but a large number of leaseholders did respond, thankfully, um, to the to the leasehold office at the time, and we were allowed a certain level of funding to run the association, which we still, you know, we still have that level of funding. And, and uh, as I say, we you know we can help leaseholders out um, with, if necessary. Although we don't like to go that route, we hope to sort of like try and sort it out with the officers themselves. But if, we ne if necessary, we can go down the legal route and get legal advice, etc., um, about things. But they're, they're in very few circumstances, you know. But yes, I mean, more interaction with our members. Um, I wouldn't like to say once we've once we've um, put our leasehold member right in either getting somebody to contact them or giving them a name and a number to call. Um, we generally don't hear from them again. So I'm assuming, um, although on, on a couple of occasions I've had, follow I've had to deal with follow-up calls, but uh, I'm assuming that the majority of the members that we deal with that have got complaints, once we've, once we've given them advice, they're happy with that. Thank you. Rod, did you indicate? Thank you, Chairman. If I heard you correctly, um, Councillor Farley, you also made reference to consultation and consultation between the, the, the council and, and leaseholders. And correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, but I think the, the presenting situation at the moment is the council's um, uh, stance with consultation is to do statutory consultation, which is the minimum. And that's frequently in relation to decisions which have already been taken regarding major works um, and, and planned maintenance. So really, Alan, his membership and leaseholders are on the receiving end of decisions which have already been made. So you know, we're back to this bottom about you know, really information and the consultation is really one way um, rather than that next level of there's perhaps so much money in the pot and where are the priorities for tenants and leaseholders in terms of the capital program um, or our investment decisions. So in relation to health and safety, yep, there's statutory requirements, it's got to be done, but there might well be presenting issues in a particular estate or building that we're not aware of. Um, so that, that sort of um, bottom-up approach is perhaps what's missing. And I think maybe um, in the past Alan's made, made reference to um, as I say, statutory consultation is the bare minimum and it does tend to reflect the fact that decisions have already been made rather than involving tenants and leaseholders in um, at least influencing those decisions and those priorities in terms of spend. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Um, maybe perhaps I could ask you for your question in regards to our external partners. You've touched on the issue of antisocial behaviour, and as you appreciate, it may not always be down to the council, depending on what the type of ASP is. It may be the police, for example, or indeed if you have utility issues. In your opinion, how do you feel the council communicates with you in signposting you to those correct partners? Uh, do you feel you get enough information from the council? Uh, and if not, what do you feel can be done to improve on that? Most of the information that I get on external partners such as SNTs, etc., actually comes via email from the SNTs themselves. Um, I, use, I go to meetings at our local Greenway Centre and we have 
we have during COVID obviously we haven't had any meetings um, we're due to have a meeting in the next month or two but I go to meetings where SNTs and their representatives turn up um, we talk about crime in the area that type of thing um, we always get lists of current email addresses telephone numbers of all the SNTs in the borough so that I, you know, if I need to like, pass it on to somebody else, um, that's there. The one thing I will say is that it's probably SNTs are <coughs> very, very busy. You know, um, I know for a fact that um, in Melbourne House in Hayes, um, we've got a committee member who's also a councillor, Councillor Lindsay Bliss. She's always complaining about people on the stairwells getting in through the front doors etc uh, that's because people just buzz them in um, getting on the stairwells smoking taking drugs yeah. um, at one stage they were thought they'd have a, a fun game and they were like putting the lighters to the ceiling panels and burning holes in the ceiling panels that type of thing now these crimes are reported you know and the SNTs will make the odd visit doing this state walk around but that's few and far between, you know, you're not actually catching the people when the crimes are being done, you know. And as it's a regular occurrence, it's, it just seems, I think, to tenants or residents um, that perhaps not enough is being done to deter antisocial behaviour. I mean, even, our, even the local uh, council antisocial behaviour teams, they're snowed under with work. You know, if you report antisocial behaviour, um, to the ASB team, you know, you could be waiting months and months and months for a, you know, uh, for the, the, the problem to be actually sorted out to its end um, and, and, and problem sorted. It's awkward, you know, because you sometimes think that the SNT, uh, sorry, the antisocial behaviour team aren't taking you seriously. Um, but I, I do believe that, like a lot of these teams, SNTs and antisocial behaviour teams, there's probably too much to do and not enough staff to do it. You know, that's my own opinion. You know. Yes, Ross? I'm chair of the local ward panel for the police. Another thing I do. Um, so I, I'm able to hear what, what's going on um, and I can report myself on antisocial behaviour in, in our blocks it's really bad with people getting in um, sleeping rough um, on the landings um, drug taking drinking um, just real antisocial behaviour problems sometimes extremely abusive um, and um, the, the safer neighbourhood teams are, are just so busy and they they're not always on duty when you ask them to come. Today, I, we've had a rough sleeper um, and he's been causing a bit of a nuisance and I tried to ring the, the local, uh, my local policeman, um, but he wasn't on duty again today. Um, it, it, it's very hard, really. Um, in 2013, I asked if we could have CCTV entry um, and Councillor Bianco um, granted me that money um, because he said that he could see that it was badly needed well I didn't get it but Harding House got it um, which I was a bit miffed about to say the least um, and that still remains the problem. They, they buzz you to come in in the middle of the night sometimes. At 2 o'clock in the morning, they'll buzz you and say, um, open the door, we want to come in. Uh, we know where you live. We know what number you are. We'll come up there if you don't let us in. And, you know, I just put mine off. Um, it used to upset my husband greatly um, he passed away in April so he, he doesn't have to get upset anymore I used to have to turn my entry off at night um, because it used to upset him greatly 
um, and it, it's a, just a nuisance. Um, now I'm on my own, I leave the entry on, but um, it still happens. I don't take any notice of it, I'm just, you know, stay where I am. But people do let them in because one, because they're scared, two, because they don't know who it is down there because you can't see who it is. Um, during the day you get them buzz you to come in and they say we're an Amazon delivery um, people let them in they can't see if they're an Amazon delivery or not um, but I never got that entry system and when I, I asked um, several times why it was that I hadn't got it but I'd been granted the money for it um, during the changes I was told that that paperwork was lost and they had no record of it. Thank you. Natalie? Um, so for the antisocial behaviour, um, especially on my block of flats, um, <coughs> it said it's not the worst um, of the three block of flats, but for me I don't think that should be the, um, the point, is that it shouldn't be happening in our buildings. Um, people are not reporting anymore because they said um, when they do report, they ask questions as if, are they arrest, harassing anyone? Are they um, threatening anyone? And if the answer to any of those questions is no, then nothing is done. So um, up to, well, not as recently, but maybe in about before the COVID, um, the young, there was a young man upstairs and he was quite upset because they were smoking and it was um, irritating his mum. And he went and he spoke to them and um, they apologized but they were still there. And um, he went and he rang, he said to me he rang the council and they asked him, were, were they arresting anyone? Were they being a threat to anyone? And because he said no to both, no one came. So now people are literally not reporting it anymore. Thank you. Um, are there any further questions before I go to Councillor Farley? Okay, Councillor Farley. Thank you. Um, I guess a question for the officers. The security doors on the estates, I know I've got, I've got my own key fob, they, they are individual for each block or estate. So like for Avondale, for example, it's one fob wouldn't do all three blocks. That's correct? That's, that's correct. Um, and if we move to an estate such as Haystown Centre where there are numerous pedestrian gates, vehicle gates, access security gates, then then your FOB will be individually programmed to allow you access to certain parts of the estate, certain parking areas, etc. Yeah. Yeah. So the the newer the system, like ever, yeah, they're more sophisticated and you can you can tailor FOBs accordingly. Um, and also get get data on the use of those FOBs as well, um, which can be interesting. Thank you very much. I believe all of the members have asked their questions now, so um, if I could perhaps finish off by saying, as you've seen from the reports, this, the task of this committee is to make recommendations to the Cabinet. Um, if you wish to comment on anything that's been discussed tonight, please do so, but in closing, do you feel there's any recommendations you feel you could suggest to this committee which we could look into in perhaps adopting as part of a recommendation uh, in this review? Again. <laughs> a lot's been said tonight by Ros, by Natalie, by myself. It would be nice to see if some of the some of what we've said is acted upon. Mm -hmm. um, even small changes can make a huge difference. You know. So we'll wait and see see what goes on over the next few months or years, whatever. Okay. Thank you very much, Natalie. I do think um, as, a, as a council, as a committee, we do really need to um, look long term because um, in the 10 years just that I've been there, things have gone steadily downwards and I do think a massive change, especially in engaging especially the young, younger people because as um, Alan said, it's hard to get the, um, the younger lease holders on board because people have come in three, four, five years, they haven't seen anything happening, there's nothing for them to want to be a part of because there's nothing really happening. I think if we had stuff happening, engagement meetings, 
little things where you know people can see you guys, see faces, be, be able to match faces, because I wouldn't know who to call if I had a specific um, situation. I would probably go through switchboard who would probably put me through, or I'd probably ring Marion. But, it, <laughs> but um, basically, I'm just thinking, if we have things happening on the estates, whether it's for lease or just the tenants on a whole, residents on a whole, people will see that there's things happening and the potential of things to happen, and they maybe want to be more a part of things, because as it is at the moment, it's going to be torn down. The new things coming in, it's not going to be kept because people don't have that pride in the area that they live because there's not a lot of engagement, nothing for people to do. If you're not one of the lucky ones who's working, you're just there. So I think a bit more engagement um, tailored to different groups would make a massive difference in how things are panned out in the different um, communities. Thank you. And Voss? Just that it would be lovely to be listened to again. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your attendance this evening. It's very much appreciated, and we value your feedback. Certainly the uh, impression I'm getting this evening from the three of you is that we need more of a personal touch rather than just being a, a ticket number in a system. That's certainly the impression I've got this evening, and I think most of my colleagues would agree with that. In closing, is there anything the officers wish to uh, say before we move on? Thank you, Chair. Just, just very quickly, I think really it's, it's picking up on, um, uh, I think it was a question from, from Councillor Farley that, that, he, that he asked officers for any comment that we had on the feedback that we've heard tonight. I didn't want to gloss over that, that question or, or miss it. Um, I, think, I think the point is uh, I've noticed the changes. Just as um, our witnesses have presented tonight, I've been managing the council stock for this is the 35th year now, so I've, I've, I've been on that journey with, with our tenants and leaseholders as well, um, and things have changed, um, and over time we, we clearly have taken our lead from the Council in terms of the, the breadth and depth of involvement and engagement that we have done with tenants and leaseholders. But I think the point to reiterate now and reflecting on the earlier report that you saw at the last meeting, we are on a journey, and we are on a journey of change. We do have lots of good ideas, um, and one of the reasons that, that um, we've, we've come to members and, and select committee in particular is, is to hear your views, because we are consulting with um, a number of partners and a number of stakeholders in relation to our, our tenants and leaseholders. And if I could make my sales pitch here, um, one of the, you know, the biggest recommendations is, is to hear from select committee that um, as a landlord, as a corporate landlord, as the council, then there is recognition about the value of good quality, timely um, engagement and involvement with, with tenants and leaseholders, and also to have a, you know, a range of options which, which reflect that, that triangle so that we can engage with people at, at a pace and depth which they're comfortable with. You know, there is no one-size-fits-all. Um, and any organisation, whether they're a big retail organisation, whatever it may be, it is important that they have customer insight, you know, that they're aware of their customers' needs, and we should be focusing on the things and spending resources on the things that matter to our tenants and leaseholders. You know, that's, that's good business, um, and it's the right thing to be doing at a time when you know, resources are, are tight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rod, and thank you once again for your attendance this evening. We'll be moving on now to our next item on the agenda, but please feel, feel free to leave if you wish to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us, guys.
Okay, item 6 is the littering and fly tipping update on implementation of recommendations following our recent review. And good evening to you, Cathy. Thank you for waiting. And whenever you're ready, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Chair. So, um, we last met, I think, October um, 2019, I think. Uh, and then, obviously, we've had a busy couple of uh, years, haven't we? So uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and I just really wanted to uh, update you on the work that we have been doing um, in the uh, preceding months. Um, I've kept to the uh, key recommendations uh, set out by this panel, so I just want to update you uh, individually on that. So uh, we were tasked with um, making better uh, connections with uh, landlords and tenants uh, about uh, the rules and regulations of how to dispose of your waste, how to dispose of uh, bulky items, um, how you can report fly tipping. So uh, my recycling team um, made uh, contact uh, with um, uh, some landlords and also um, estate agents, and uh, they um, gave them a sort of like a, a, a paper welcome pack uh, which was uh, went down very well and was uh, uh, used a lot, particularly by Coopers. Um, but we have uh, developed that now further to an electronic version, uh, which we can just send off to them, and then the uh, estate agents, landlords, can either print it out themselves or they can, again, ele ele electronically send it to their residents and their customers. So um, that has gone down um, uh, very well indeed. Um, Point two, uh, beautification and uh, civic responsibility. Um, I have to say, I, I come into work on the, via the Stockley Roundabout and the uh, wild flowers that uh, greeted me every single morning was breathtaking. Um, and it looked absolutely gorgeous. And um, there has been some um, uh, evidence that where these um, are open spaces partners have um, um, planted these areas, they have been mainly uh, kept litter free and well respected. Um, I am uh, speaking on behalf of uh, my ASB colleagues here with the new warning. Uh, a standard template advisory letter is available and circulated to all officers uh, to use. Unfortunately, they didn't send me a copy, so I don't have one, but um, th th there apparently is one. Um, I, we have now um, joined the Keep Britain Tidy uh, group, and I've certainly been to uh, a couple of online sem uh, seminars. Um, However, we haven't yet found a suitable campaign that messes with uh, our Hillingdon Com. So I'm working on that. I'm working with Emma Gilbertson, and we're going to be uh, going through the Keep Britain Tidy catalogue, seeing what campaigns uh, we can both work with and pushing that forward. Um, there was a suggestion to look at referencing, putting a reference number on each uh, litter bin. Uh, we, we did explore this at some length, but it, it would be cost, uh, um, um, we, we couldn't do it due, due to the cost. Uh, and then, you know, we do get quite a few bins vandalised, and then we'd have to go and get the number plaque again and keep up the register. And it was just, uh, um, we felt, too onerous to do. Um, Hard-hitting campaigns. I hope all of you um, have seen all the fantastic work that our comms team uh, has done over the last 18 months. Um, uh, I, I won't go through all of these things that they've given you here, but I mean they really have. I, I, I work very closely with Masuma, who um, has come from another council, uh, and she's got lots of lots of waste experience. She is really proactive. She is fantastic to work with and um, in actual fact um, our um, food waste campaign uh, has been shortlisted for uh, an award um, so you know it's not just me saying it it's a national award and it's been shortlisted so um, that's very exciting um, we did some changes on street cleansing and uh, rather than having a fly tipping team, a mobile team, we combined them all together and we actually made them um, look after um, wards. So it's kind of like we, we wanted the crew to adopt their area um, and, and, and rather than 
uh, driving past something because they haven't got a ticket for or they thought, oh, oh, Bob's coming, he can pick it up. They actually have to be proactive and uh, don't wait for a ticket, don't wait for an instruction. If they see something that's knees picking up or knees actioning or sweeping, they do it because it's their area and they get to know the area, they get to know the hotspot areas and the trouble areas. Um, and as a result of that, um, the table uh, that is in page uh, 18 actually shows you that reported fly tipping has actually decreased, uh, which I think is fantastic news. So fly tipping happens, but before a resident can say, oh, I'm, I need to contact the uh, civic centre, we pick it up. So uh, I think that's a real feather in our cap and we should be really proud of that. Um, uh, Neil uh, sent you all around an email today. I don't know if you've all had a chance to look at it, but it was the um, catching the fly tippers on CCTV. Um, uh, so that was our first one that we did, uh, and that's gone out. Uh, and again, um, Mazuma is working really hard with um, um, our CCTV office um, legal to make sure that what we're putting out is uh, acceptable to do, um, fuzzing out. Um, things like uh, car registrations and stuff like that. But um, I I'm very excited to push that forward and to actually say, you know, we are looking to name and shame who is that person that is doing this behaviour. Someone must know them, and it's a deterrent. That's what we're looking for. I also quite like watching them. I think it's quite fascinating. <laughs> um, so, um, um, so we are, so yeah, so, so we're doing that uh, um, uh, as we speak. What else have we been doing? We've been very busy uh, moving things forward. Um, so, um, the, again, this is for uh, my ASBIT colleagues. So, uh, the Council uh, to Publicise Successful Prosecutions, um, they've got one outstanding case. However, um, it's awaiting uh, sentencing at the moment. <laughs> and um, I think um, for legal reasons, they have to keep that uh, all, all uh, a little bit... Um, quite at the moment, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that um, there's going to be some positive results of that and uh, that, that that team will be working hard on those areas. You know, it's, it, it's, it's very time consuming to take someone to court and sometimes the fines don't always uh, reflect the time, the effort or the offence, but, you know, let's keep on doing it and let's uh, um, advertise it uh, once we've got uh, the conviction and the right result. Uh, volunteering uh, and young people. Wow. So um, this re this um, um, uh, request um, steer was done before COVID. Who knew post COVID that we would have and be engaging so closely with um, the Hillingdon uh, litter pickers? There's about 500 of them. Um, um, they personally think that my street cleansing manager, Dave Rance, is an absolute hero and he keeps on telling me about it every time. Uh, but we, we engage with them, we give them bags, we give them litter pickers. They're, they're now so um, uh, well managed. I think they've got their own litter pickers now and stuff like that. But we give them the bags, they go and litter pick, uh, and then we go and collect. And uh, uh, I'm on the, their Facebook page. They, they're tweeting about, oh, I ran in the park and I picked up a bag. And, you know, it, they're, they're just absolutely fantastic. Um, schools. Um, so um, I hope you have seen the engagement we've had with the food waste trucks and schools. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, we are starting now that the schools are back. We are now starting to um, um, in engage with them. But because of the COVID, that was all delayed. And uh, so hopefully next time you invite me, I'll have some more exciting um, points to discuss on that. Um, and also the community payback. Um, I do believe I was on a meeting today and they are uh, going out, I think, for the first time um, Friday uh, to a couple of, uh, uh, of uh, the wards. And I have asked um, that whilst it's not my team um, that is um, managing this project, that uh, um, comms are involved in that so that we can capture all this really great work and we can tell our residents about it. <coughs> Um, so that is a very speedy run through um, the work that I, I have been doing. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, before I invite questions, 
if I could just ask Neil, the warning letter from ASB, if we could get a copy of that and circulate it to members outside of the meeting. Um, who wants to go first? Councillor Gardner. We'll arm wrestle later on. Um, I'm actually quite pleased about you saying about the area groups because um, I don't know if you've seen my emails when I go out. Yes. Uh, but I have noticed that the level of rubbish is going down in a lot of the places. And I have to say the litter pickers have done a great job because I sometimes report their bags and then just says, sorry, they're not there <laughs> because they're, they've been removed. Um, do, is it ward specific, the areas, or is it just like, I don't know, one, one section of Hayes, or do they do it by the wards, the actual? They actually do it by the wards. So. Um, uh, I'm sure if, if I'm wrong, you're, someone will correct me. I believe there are 22 wards uh, in the borough. Uh, so we, we looked at each individual ward and also um, the activities in each ward. So uh, where we have antisocial behaviour, fly tipping, uh, hotspot areas, we gave them more resources than maybe other wards. Um, because the, 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 we weren't getting the, 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 the work out of the, the teams. So um, we, we, we went from north to south and we looked at all the wards and each ward has got their dedicated own team. They may have, so that team may look after one ward, two wards, one ward may be split in half and they have two teams, but each team is dedicated to a specific ward area. Yep. Can I also say that uh, Dave Grant is a bit of a hero? <laughs> well, I mean, he, he actually came round and dropped some litter pickers off for me because I was actually... Um, Scott and I pick up litter when we see it because I've spent my life saying to my kids, take your litter home with you. And I thought, well, you know, all the stuff that I see in the street. I, I, prior to getting the litter picker from Dave, I was using the thing that I got when I had my hip replaced, which wasn't as strong as, as that. So all I need now is some proper bags. I will let Mr. Rance know your comments uh, if I have to, uh, and uh, if you need anything, uh, you know you you're always in contact with Jess. Um, you know, um, just let us know, and we'll 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 action it. Thank you very much. Um, just on the ward teams, is there an opportunity to perhaps introduce these team members to the ward councillors for that area, just so we can put a name to a face? Or they may encounter them on their walkabouts and things like that. Absolutely, so. that would be fantastic. So we are doing a lot of um, campaigns. You know, um, I think um, one of the toughest jobs um, that my team done is, is actually the solo barrow beats. They're out in all weathers, pushing, cleaning up around uh, um, our borough, uh, and uh, you know they work on their own. Um, so we are going to be doing a comms campaign. Um, to introduce uh, all the solar beats, uh, to say, hi, I'm Jim, and on social media. And yeah, I think our residents really, really love that. Um, so we are, I, I want to make um, um, the, um, the, certainly all of my staff, really, if I can do, I, you know, this is who is cleaning your street. Here's Bob, he's worked for 20 odd years, um, so I'm doing that. But yeah, I will absolutely um, look at doing that with the wards. Brilliant. I think it would also benefit in terms of the complaints or any sort of issues we have. It would be far better if they knew the person or a friendly face when I say, oh, it's that council again, I'm going to call and complain about it. They might be a bit more hesitant and take it a bit more calmly when they approach these issues. Um, Councillor Kaufman. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, Cathy, for your report. Um, one or two bits here. I'll tell you what, let me show you our litter picking team. Um, <laughs> this is me props department. Um, because they go out in the winters as well, so we had the storm coats, so we got those from Jess, but we paid for them out of our war budget. Um, these are 14 quid each, they're brilliant, mm. but that means they've got to wear high vis when they go out, so they've got the normal sort of tabards but they then go out in the winter with this stuff and they do need it. Um, the other thing that I was going to mention was the street sweepers, they're, they're brilliant and they have got a, a terrible job when you look at the fact when you've got parked cars. Mm. Now, they used to carry a flat broom and it was... 
Uh, excuse me, Chairman. <laughs> it was I'm you know, Go ahead. about that width, and it, it was about two inches thick. So they could get down the side of the cars, you know, the tyres and the kerb. And I just wondered if that was uh, possible, because most of the streets that they cover have got a lot of cars, you know. Um, let me just see. I think that was all I was going to say, actually, Cathy. Um, yeah, but just as a bit of praise for street cleansing, I mean, Jess is brilliant. Mm -hmm. She is the star of the show. And, um, you know, uh, whatever you ask her, it's mm -hmm. done, you know. But So your department, it really is the best. Thank you very much again. I, I don't mind telling Jess she's super. That's, uh, that's, that's not a problem at all. Um, I know exactly what brooms you mean. They're, they're the white uh, nylon flick uh, brooms. Yeah. I'll, 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 I wasn't aware that we no longer use them. I'll have a look when I, when I get back yeah. and just to make sure that they are being issued and that they are being used because you're absolutely right. The bigger brooms between curb and car you just can't get. It just no. won't, won't accurate, will it? No. I know I've got something else but I'll think about that in a minute. Thank you very much, and congratulations, Councillor Cavan, for being the first member to use props in this meeting. So uh, <laughs> it's like a magician. I was waiting for the rabbits to come out from under the table. So, Councillor Farley. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Cathy. Um, I, 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 hopefully, the, the committee will agree. I, um, I, I just want to praise the, the, the efforts and the work that the waste services teams have done during COVID. Um, I mean, obviously, very dangerous dealing, dealing with, with soil, you know, masks, and whatever else. So it's, you know, I, would, I would hope that that, that, uh, that we pass through the chair that that's, that's uh, recognised. Um, I'd like to just sort of go back to, um, I mean, it may not be something that you're deeply involved in, but the, the prosecutions and, and uh, catching people. I mean, I, I actually think, I think it's the second one I've seen on social media, because um, I think there was one that was in Pinkwell uh, a few weeks ago on, on Twitter, and then the, the one that came out today as well, um, which was quite interesting with the guy on the left. Um, the, I just wanted to sort of get on the record what is needed to get a prosecution or I, in terms of say I, I report something, I've got evidence it, it belongs to someone who's got a name and address on it but there have been times where it hasn't sort of gone any further so I'm just trying to get an understanding and a grip on what it is that's needed to be able to go maybe to a penalty, to a fine and, and so forth, thank you um, so uh, once a month, uh, my one of my mobile teams used to work with our enforcement team, and they would go out uh, for uh, five days, working across the uh, borough on non-collection days, non-refuse collection days, um, splitting open bags that had been dumped and getting evidence, and then we would issue them a fixed penalty notice, which uh, 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 amounted to a £400 fine, because Hillingdon goes for the maximum. Unfortunately, uh, then uh, we got legal advice to say uh, just finding evidence with a name and address in a bag does not mean you can issue uh, under law a fixed penalty notice. So you need to physically see someone doing it, uh, get there. I'm, I'm working on it. I am, I am very, very keen to uh, 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 penalise flytippers. I think it's a deterrent. I think they talk about it. I think it stops other people. It's a, it's a way of, of educating. Um, um, but um, the legality is, is something that's holding us back at the moment. Uh, but I'm, I'm reading what I can do and uh, seeing what I can do, because uh, it was a fantastic exercise once a month, I think I think we used to issue something like 200 fixed penalty notices each time, each week, you know, and and at 400 pounds, that's that's a lot of deterrent. Mm. Um, so it's it's legal, it's very onerous on um, the legal side of it. Councillor Farley, do you wish to add anything? Thank you, Chair. Um, so. Uh, in terms of the identification of the individual, so it's either been witnessed, someone's either got a testimony from a resident or a councillor or, or whoever that they've done it. Um, the CCTV that is now going out, which I think is is, is really good, um, 
you know, so this is no, naming and shaming part of it, because I, I think that, that's a good idea. Um, that's still, I guess, reliant on someone telling you who they are and identifying who they are, because I know we've, we, we've had issues with, um, you know, we've seen it being done, but it's at a distance. You know, bags are dumped by, by litter bins and so on, but, you know, they, they go out of shot. You can't, you know, you can't be really sort of follow them where, where they're going. So uh, that, yeah, that that's that, that's that's fine. Um, but it, it's it's I guess it's sort of how you get or how you can promote uh, people coming forward. Because I've I've, I've spoken with residents where they where they're reluctant to do that because they fear repercussions mm. and and so on. So how 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 do we as a council uh, try and overcome that sort of barrier it's a tricky one you know if um if 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 someone wants to you know our residents are very uh, are, um um keen on reporting fly chipping so they just want it removing however saying who put it there is is a is a uh, another thing altogether um and um you know quite rightly some of our residents don't want to get involved they just want the rubbish gone um, so, you know, I think it's just a case of um, trying uh, different ways of promoting. Um, uh, I know that um, we did road shows uh, this um, summer, which was really well attended. I think we managed to reach over 4,000 residents on our road shows. And maybe we can have a look at, um, you know, whilst the road shows this year were looking at recycling and promoting our new food waste service, Perhaps we could have a look about saying, you know, getting feedback from our residents while we're there talking to them to say, you know, how do you think we could encourage you to uh, be more proactive in uh, reporting fly tipping and, and talking to our residents about it. They're the ones with the answer, I think. Um, so, you know, maybe we could uh, have a look at, 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 you know, engaging with our residents more on that subject and also making it a talking point. I mean, that's what these videos are for. I'm not expecting someone to ring up and say, it, uh, you know, I know who that is. What I am hoping is that they go, gosh, did you see that? Isn't that awful behaviour? And, and, you know, and also making um, them more aware of, 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 you know, what a fly tip is. Because again, I think a lot of our residents, and we, we, we could be seen as being, uh, you know, creating our own problem really. Our residents put rubbish out and we collect it. So they're doing the right thing then, aren't they? Because nothing else is happening. They put out rubbish and we collect it, and usually on the same day. So I think we do have to look at saying, Whilst we're collecting it, that's not the behaviour we want you to do. So I, I'm much more interested in in exploring that area. How do we let our residents know, um, you know, look, these are the other options for you. Don't do this. You can do that. You can do this. Um, but at the moment, I am sending, and I'm aware of it, I am sending very mixed messages to our residents to say, you put it out and I'll come and collect it. Thank you very much. Um, Kathy, on section 2D, when it mentioned the unique reference number, um, I understand that the officers are not going to pursue that, but if memory serves, it must have been about two years ago now, I think in Uxbridge Southward there was the introduction of, I suppose I'd call it a smart bin, which was based on solar power, and it would inform the council of when the rubbish bin was getting full and when it required emptying. So I would assume that's sort of a unique bin or reference number in itself. How did that trial go, how did that scheme go? Is it something that officers are looking to pursue further or is it dead in the water, so to speak? Yeah, so that, that bin's got the, the lovely name of the Big Belly Bin. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's usually a bigger uh, bin and it, it does give an indication. We are not taking it f further forward uh, for, for um, two major reasons. Um, one, if a resident puts a cardboard box in there without breaking it down, it'll actually set the trigger to, to say, I'm full. Well, in actual fact, it's a sensor that's blocked, not by rubbish, but by a large item. And secondly, um, I think, if we were in a very rural area where there were a beauty spots where litter bins were three miles away, and I wasn't regularly going past them, that sort of bin would make total sense to me. I'm not going to travel out until I know that bin is full. However, 
within Hillingdon, I walk past a bin, well, I would empty it, even if the centre is saying to me, actually, I'm only half full. As I'm walking past to go to another bin, I'm going to empty that bin. So I, they're, they're expensive. They have got some flaws. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have any bins where I have to travel an awful long way to go and, and collect it. So uh, we won't be taking that forward. Thank you for confirming that. Councillor Kaufman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, on page 17, um, and this is to do with beautifying the, uh, the area, um, we've got um, planters in both of our town centres, and they look absolutely amazing, and also ba uh, hanging baskets. But these were all paid for by, uh, one was the RAF, Residents Association, so sometimes you can get these things put up. Uh, they cost a lot of money, obviously, but um, associations are prepared to pay for it. Plus, we've got a wall budget which we can help out with um, if we need to. Um, the other thing is that um, on sort of long areas within um, uh, highways, uh, for instance, um, we've got some long grass areas in front of DFS and Curries. And when we found out that you could get um, through the council, they come over in the spring, or sorry, late late autumn, and they plant thousands of bulbs along these areas. And we've got three sections now, and in the spring it is amazing, this amount of um, daffodils and tulips and all that sort of stuff. And I think that's something you ought to look, be looking at. I thought the, um, the wildflowers was great, until the big stuff came through and drowned all the poppies, etc., and they started to get really raggy before we sort of cut them down. Um, so it's a mixed message um, with the residents, but nevertheless, it, a great job. Mm. Um, and a quick one, just on litter picking. We've got something like 10 to 15 litter pickers, and they've been doing it for about five years now. And um, it's just not about litter picking. They meet at the library one hour uh, for one hour every month, um, and then they go out litter picking. Then they come back, and the library um, uh, we, we have coffee, and uh, one of the residents brings donuts. And the fellowship between that group is so tight, mm. and it's lovely to see. Actually, it really is, you know. And if I go down there, it, 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 it's all about politics. And <laughs> <stuff like that. laughs> but nevertheless, it's really nice to see, and I think the library benefits from mm -hmm. our group. Um, and if you had, you know, groups all over the for, for Hillingdon, sure, terrific. But that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And our, our people, they collect about 170 kilos every every month, and it's just <coughs> amazing the amount of yep. stuff, you know. And what? <laughs> That's me, done with another. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, time's marching on, so we'll make a finish. But um, Councillor Farley, I know you wish to ask questions. Anyone else before I move on after Councillor Farley? No. Nope. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Big quick questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the hotspots. Um, I just want to, in terms of, of, of driving past and so forth, I just want to sort of how you, how you measure that. I know you said with the, the, the statistics you got on the other page, it's, it's showing sort of a trend. But I was wondering how you sort of measure what's going on in terms of them driving past, how you know that that's happening. Um, the other thing I want to know about, again, we're back into this, this thing about the, the um, promotion of the naming and shaming, so to speak, which platforms you're, you're using for that? Because I've seen, I've seen Twitter, but I haven't seen anything else. Um, and then also, just finally, Chair, sorry, uh, so on page 19 over to 20, uh, the ASBIT officers, so this, this naming and shaming, I just wanted to know about, it's, it's, it's in place, I wanted to know what, what the frequency of that was in terms of communication and whether or not it's a mass email to all councillors or just to specific wards where that's happening, please. Thank you, Chair. Okay, you may need to remind me of <laughs> as we go right so the first question was regarding the data 
uh, of the litter picks and how to get the hotspots. So um, we, with the um, street cleansing, uh, and I'm going to call them proactive actions, we don't capture that at the moment uh, because they jump out, they collect it, they, it, it goes. Um, so the only um, hotspot mapping that I do, and I do do them, is with our reported. Um, so uh, I've got a fantastic colleague, uh, Julie Swales. I ring her up and I'll go, Julie, can you give me uh, in uh, um, ward um, or, or, or road details all the reported um, fly tipping? And then uh, I send that to our GIS team and they put it on a map for me and it's red, yellows, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. So I track it that way. Moving forward, um, street cleansing is going to have in-cab technology um, installed uh, in each vehicle. Um, so there could be a way for me to record um, um, when they've picked up, what road, so I can start to gain more information um, from each individual um, team. So that's the first question. Your second question was, please remind me. Okay, yes, so um, again, um, I think at the moment that's always, that, that is only on Twitter, but uh, I, I see no reason why our comms team can't pop that out on uh, Facebook uh, and any other platform, uh, maybe um, have it on our web uh, page as well so people can click on it. Um, so I think we're rolling out on Twitter, just seeing how uh, it's, it's being responded to, uh, but I would be very surprised if, if you don't see it on Facebook very soon. And finally, I'm not sure I can answer the, the, your last question, but do it to me again. Uh, and what, what um, item number are we talking about? So it's uh, bottom of page 19, uh, item D, uh, over the page uh, it's to do with these um, uh, publicly naming and shaming. It's, it's in place. I wanted to know what the frequency was of that and if it was a mass email to all councillors or it was individual to the board. Thank you. Uh, I'm very sorry, but I am going to have to uh, ask the ASBIT office to actually respond to you directly on that. I'm afraid I don't have those details. I'm very sorry. <laughs> thank you, anyway. Thanks thank you. Lot. Okay. Thank you very much, Cathy, for coming this evening. Always okay. a pleasure to see you at the Go committee. On. And yep. We still have Cathy's second report. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm, going, I'm jumping way ahead. Oh, sorry, it's not quite over yet. <laughs> it's getting late, that's why. Go ahead. Go on. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chairman. So, um, so item seven... Um, there was a request just to be updated on our recycling work and what we were doing. Uh, and even if I say so myself, we are doing some fantastic work on recycling. Uh, and we have um, also, I don't know if, if you guys have seen it, we won a, an award uh, last week yes, for um, taking um, uh, used needles, which our residents were using for their medication, but because doctor's surgeries were no longer accessible to them, there was confusion. Uh, messages from maybe um, district nurses weren't correct. And they were thinking, well, the needle was made of plastic and metal, therefore I can recycle it. And we were having lots of needle injuries with our staff and also our, at BIFA. So we have been working with the NHS to get the message out about our clinical service, using fly posters, um, uh, leaflets, um, social media and in actual fact as a result of that our clinical waste and demand for needles has uh, quadrupled um, so um, th that's just a, a, a really good uh, piece of evidence and uh, was, was rightly recognised uh, with an award last week so food waste we have um, since we last met we have rolled out our segregated food waste service there are several benefits of rolling out um, food waste and picking it up separately rather than collecting it with our green. First of all, it's cheaper. It's cheaper to dispose. So garden waste uh, has reduced in disposal costs and so has food waste and it's one of my uh, MTFS savings. So that is going along fantastically. Secondly, it gives me data. Before, when it was collected with garden waste, I didn't know who was using our service, where they were um, who wasn't, what participation rate. So um, by segregating it out, I now know down every single road how many caddies have been delivered, what participation rate um, is, um, if there's um, problems with um, contamination. I can uh, get that recorded because the food waste uh, cabs do have the in-cab technology in. They were the first ones to have it rolled out. 
So uh, they can flag up to say uh, this caddy was contaminated. That information then goes to our recycling officer and we make contact with the resident to say, you know, thanks for using our uh, food waste service. However, can we just go over what you can and can't put in it again? So uh, it's, it's a fantastic um, um, service. We had a lot of fun with the five vehicles naming it, getting the kids involved. Uh, and um, uh, uh, every month, uh, food waste tonnages increase so that is um, you know a, a well used service I want more people to use it it costs us a fortune when we put um, food and dispose of it in black sacks fortune let's move it into the caddies um, and um, let's get that moving and then as you can see loads and loads of social media um, out on um, uh, that um, we uh, also, um, so each uh, quarter we uh, do work uh, called um, a waste data flow analysis. Uh, it's something that uh, the government asks us to do and uh, we, it is um, part of our legislation. And on page 26 you'll find a table and I've just done um, us and our five other um, boroughs that make up the West London uh, Waste Authority. And I just want to say, with the exception of Hounslow, um, um, Hillingdon uh, has increased by 2% difference between uh, our first quarter of this year and our first quarter of last year. We've increased um, recycling by 2%. And when we are a borough that collects unlimited black sacks every single week, that growth is fantastic. Um, we've also done a lot of work at New Year's Green Lane. I don't know if any of you have visited it recently, but we've got a lovely new signage. What we are hoping to do is just make um, recycling for our residents when they visit New Year's Green Lane that much easier. And we've got uh, bright pinks and purples and blues. We tell our customers, um, you know, what, uh, you know, if you recycle uh, a piece of wood, where does it go to? What happens with it? And we've done it all on the, the signs. Um, so it's it's trying to just encourage when when residents go to the tip if they could segregate out their waste and don't put it all in black bags to throw over the wall, but segregate it and we can recycle so much more material. I've mentioned the road shows uh, uh, already. Um, over 4,500 residents were spoken to, which I think is just fantastic. Uh, and they they went they were really really popular. I think our residents, um, you know, they 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 really value having face to face contact with, uh, with 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 us at Hillingdon. And each road show um, was was just uh, you know so well attended uh, and, and the residents just really enjoyed it. Um, uh, we are rolling out um, um, recycling facilities to our in-house flats. Um, I think that until we have our own housing stock with uh, recycling bins, I can't throw stones at private developments. We need to get our house in order first of all. Um, so uh, we're doing it over three phases. The first phase was we've already got recycling facilities in there, but let's re just refresh our residents as to what they can do. Second phase was we didn't have recycling bins, but we did have an area to put them, so we could uh, start delivering those. And the third and final phase, which is um, uh, a bit more difficult and certainly more costly, is no recycling facilities and no space to put them. So what do we do in those areas? But as you can see from the charts, uh, my, re my recycling team have been really, really busy and uh, have been rolling out uh, recycling to our flats. And again on page 29, just a simple bin where there was just a simple thing of, and uh, unfortunately it is in black and white, but the, the before picture, there's this uh, um, recycling bin. It looks a little bit unloved. It looks a little bit poorly. And what we've done is we've given it a really good brush up. We've put new signing on it, and it, we've made it look fresher and more um, uh, user-friendly and more welcoming. Uh, I've spoken to you about us working in partnership with the NHS, and that's what we got the award for, so I won't go on uh, and talk about that. Uh, what I will say is that uh, on page 30, um, DMR, I'm sorry, I should have put that uh, in full for you, DMR is dry mixed recycling. 
Uh, and basically, we have done a lot of work to reduce contamination of the uh, see-through plastic sack. And as a result of that, our costs per tonne have dropped from £73.26 and 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 to £26.45. And that is a huge saving. Uh, and we have to keep on working on that because uh, um, it, it, it all balances. You know, if I put in a truck that's, that's highly contaminated, that price will go back up again. So you have to keep your finger on the pulse. You have to keep working on it. You have to keep on informing residents. We would love this. We don't want that. And also, um, I hope you are all aware that we have now removed textiles from our recycling. That has saved a fortune. We had to put it into our dust carts and then at New Year's Green Lane try and pull it out. You know, we needed to do it better than that. So we have now um, budded up with a charity called Trade. Uh, go online, have a look at them. They do some, some fantastic work. And now we have budded up with them, partnered up with them at no cost to us. They will collect your textiles at a time and date to suit you. So you can keep your textiles indoors. Once they're wet, they're useless. Um, it means that I can, I can now have a, a residence in flats using that service because they can book it online and trade will come and visit them. And also, they will also collect small wee. That's anything with a small electrical circuit, so a hair dryer, something like that, up to about a microwave, which we have never offered our customers, our residents before. So that, I think, is a fantastic move, really, really positive move. Um, uh, I, I've, I've put in our latest stats, um, uh, which is actually, um, I think it was uh, last month. Um, so our recycling overall stood at 44.3%. Um, which is fantastic. A lot of that is garden waste, so I am expecting that to start going down. Um, but 43% is 44% uh, is, is fantastic. Uh, gosh, and I think that's about it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, Councillor Kaufman, through the chair, please. Is there anyone indicating before? I think Councillor Farley was first, so we'll take him. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy, for that. that. Um, I just uh, a couple of things. I mean, the recycling roadshows, I attended one in, in uh, Hayes Town. It was, it was very, very popular. I think when I attended, I mean, they've been going for an hour or two, and I think they, they, they were on their third delivery of, 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 of bags yeah. at the time. Um, so, yes, yeah, it was extremely popular. Um, I just want to get clarity. So, the, the food waste, what, just so I'm clear, because I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, where does that, what, what happens to it? I, mean, is it, I just want to get to what, what's the, the end result of where, where it goes. So pleased you asked me this. I, if, if you've got an hour, I could talk you through the whole oh, process. No, <laughs> but no. It basically goes to an anaerobic digester. So basically, all our food waste goes to a, a, a site that cooks the food waste, warms it up, and because of that process, uh, electricity heat is collected, which produces electricity. So that goes in back into the main grid. And then you are left with this really great liquid fertilizer, which is put on local farmlands uh, to then grow crops to then go into the food waste. So it's, it's, a, it's a big circle. Councillor Kaufman. Thank you, Chairman. Use your microphone, please. Thank you. All I wish to know, uh, Cathy, is um, who won the competition for naming the, the waste trucks. Oh, well, my, uh, my vote would have been Sir Recycle Lot. I think that was good. They, 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 so all five of them. So we have oh, something right, like right. um, uh, 4,000 entries. And I think the report said it was over 3,000 voting, which is probably the same for an electoral ward in an election. Yeah. So <laughs> puts us to shame, doesn't it? Um, Councillor Chapman. In ter just, just a quick question. In terms of the food bins, you, you mentioned the participation rate. What is it exactly? I mean, I know what the term is, but what, what is the percentage of 
households that have been at the moment? So at the moment, when I first started uh, in the 10th of May, when we rolled it out, we had around about 30,000 participants. Um, now we have 39. So I just want to keep getting that message out. Use your food waste caddy. It's a weekly service. It's fantastic. We get two lots of recycled material. One is electricity, one is liquid fertilizer. And it saves the residents money that can go somewhere else to social care or mm -hmm. to our libraries or you know, so um, um, I'm just going to keep on banging that drum because I want it up, up, up. Uh, it's, it's, it needs to be higher. And you, sorry, yeah, you, sure. As you know, we I discussed it with you about a month ago in terms of us advertising it. You, not much fun, but you have got plenty of caddies in Parlington Road for when we cause a rush, so to speak. Absolutely, I've got you extra ones. Oh, that, and, and, and then we didn't do anything. So <laughs> Thank you. Also, just with the food waste bins, um, one of our sort of selling points to residents locally in our ward is that it deters the foxes because they don't split the bags open and the food waste bins are the perfect solution. Have you noticed any decline in the amount of complaints you get from foxes splitting bags open for those who have taken on the food waste bin? I haven't, but what I do do is that when I do get a complaint about foxes splitting open bags, I always ask the question, do you use our food waste service? And invariably they don't. And then I say, why don't you? It would be fantastic. I can get you a caddy uh, delivered. So, you know, I, I promote it that way because that it absolutely does. If more people were to use, put their food waste in their food caddy, we wouldn't have the, the split bags that we have currently. Councillor Gardner? Can I make a suggestion? Because of the way that you describe what you do with the food waste. And it's quite useful if you actually gave that information to schools so they can so the, the kids can take that information home to their parents. So unless you'd like to go and stand in front of every every uh, assembly. But I think that'd be uh, just having a sheet saying if you use this, this is what will happen. Because it's not an opener for me. Basically, I mean, I used the food waste thing. I didn't give it a second thought where it went or what it did. So we are looking to do um, like a video um, uh, of the, the, you know, what happens to your waste. So I want to do it for recycling and I want to do it for food waste because you're absolutely right. A lot of people uh, don't understand what happens uh, to their food waste and, and, and why it's so important to use that service. And we are also going to be uh, um, uh, rolling it out to schools um, at, because, you know, I want our kids to go home and say to mum and dad, why haven't we got a food waste caddy? Let's go and get one. Let's go and, you know, or here's a food waste caddy. We got them from school and this is how you use it. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I am absolutely behind any promotion whatsoever for the food waste service. Okay. Could I just make a suggestion on the food waste? We have recycling bags with text on it and we have the green waste bags. Is there any way when we order the new stock of bags, could we perhaps amend the word on that to say sign up for our food waste bin service in addition to this by visiting this website or this, call this number? If that I will makes certainly sense. investigate that. Um, I'm not quite sure whether that falls within our current specification, um, but I, I will certainly have a look at that. Yeah. Thank you. Just an opportunity to promote on our existing services and just suggest it to residents while they're using those. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. So, Kathy, thank you very much for your attendance. Um, and we will move on now to our forward plan, pages 33 to 40. Any comments or questions? Nope. Which mm -hmm. case, thank you. <laughs> and our work program, are we happy to note that as well? Yep. Thank you very much and thank you for your attendance this evening with the meeting declared closed at 10 past 9. Thank you very much.